Hey, Eli Stance, looking at Rambler. Um, sorry, it's been a bit of a hiatus as we've tried to get our farm going, but I did run across an old story, recognized a couple of places, thought I'd read it to you, and then maybe point out where those are at. Um, Gwinnett, his, I'm sorry, the Georgia Historic Newspaper site, which is um, hosted by um, UGA, uh, you can search a number of places on there. Uh, a lot of the Gwinnett County newspapers have been digitized on there thanks to that group, as well as the Gwinnett Historical Society uh, furnishing some funds and some assistance to help th get that done. One of the newspapers that has been recorded on that site is the Gwinnett Day, is the weekly Gwinnett Herald. And I thought I ran across this story from October 16th, 1878. Thought I'd read it to you, then we'll go back through and I'll show you a couple of the spots that are mentioned in it. Davy Richardson, my old schoolmaster, the advantages of education in the early settlement of this county were very limited and very imperfect. In the earlier years, there were but few schoolhouses in the country scattered. I'm sorry, in the earlier years, there were but few schoolhouses in the county scattered far apart and off room structure, generally with dirt floors, slab benches, and a single door, and no openings but the cracks between the logs and one cut out to afford light to those learning to write. These schoolhouses were mostly located by some meeting house of the same rude structure and differed from the schoolhouse by being somewhat larger and ornamented by high rickety pulpits, its only distinguishing feature. The seats were the same, fixed a little better with slab floor and rarely a plank one for sawmills were very scarce here in those days. Those who essayed to be schoolmasters in those early times were of very limited education and what little they knew and taught was imperfectly and generally incorrectly taught, especially in the pronunciation of words. To be able to read, write, and cipher was deemed a sufficient qualification for a schoolmaster, and a man thus endowed was considered a paragon of learning and intelligence in the early times of which I write. One possessing these superior gifts was greatly deferred to by all the people by general consent. He was an important man in the neighborhood, more so than the justice of the peace or the preacher, for all agreed that he knew more than both of them. A few days after the county organized, two academies were established and built by a limited endowment by the state. One at Lawrenceville and the other near Gates Ferry in the western part of the county called Washington Academy. These inaugurated a higher plane of scholastic training, somewhat. But I came to tell my story of old Davy Richardson, my first schoolmaster. He taught at the old schoolhouse hard by old Mount Zion Meeting House, one mile southeast of Bogan's store, now known as the Old Hog Mountain House, in 1822 or 1823. Old Davy Richardson, at that time, lived on the Jefferson Road, now leading by Dr. Freeman's on the hill, to the right hand, east, and but a short distance from the Appalachian. Not a vestige of the old house now remains, and the old site is overgrown with old field pines and undergrowth, and nothing left indicating that a habitation was ever there, and such is life and perishing in the things of earth. At six years of age, I was a pupil at old David Richardson School at Old Mount Zion, and the first lesson to learn was the alphabet, and the most difficult to master of any other in all my subsequent life. There were many scenes, incidents, and circumstances that occurred there that have not, nor will they ever be blotted from my memory. The unique personal appearance of the man, the childish fears I felt for him, the great dread of his displeasure, the exalted gifts my young mind accorded him because he could spell, write, and cipher. All these impressed me, and the wonder was that one small head could carry all he knew. After a long, long period of time, like Coleridge in his old age, when he wished to recall the scenes of his childhood, it is only necessary to shut my eyes and see him each morning approaching the schoolhouse, coming up the hill with slow and faltering footsteps, with his broad-brimmed old hat tucked up on his right side, with copra's breeches fitting tightly his slender shanks and his long swallowtail coat of the same material. And I have again the identical personal of my old schoolmaster 55 years ago. This was his picture a hundred yards off. It is only necessary to shut my eyes again and I see him enter the schoolhouse with his long wrinkled cadaverous face, his long and sticking out snaggled teeth, highly colored with homemade tobacco juice. His right eye squinted and almond shaped, his left one blurred 
as round as bullet, and the eyelids immovable. It is a fact that that eye never shut even when he slept. It was said that his sergeant in the War of 1812 complimented him as the best picket in the regiment, for while his right eye slept, his left eye was always open and on duty. Such are some of the oddities of my old schoolmaster 55 years ago. It was the custom of those early times to turn out the master a few days before the expiration of the school and to make him give holiday and treat or take a ducking. The school was no exception to the general rule and I remember well the incidents of that turnout. There was a large school of Hog Mountain's rustic girls and boys, a number of them grown and hence abundantly able to turn out old Davy Richardson. The plans were laid and tomorrow was the time and the whole school notified and the strictest secrecy enjoined. The next morning came and all were on hand at an early hour and all were excited. The door was closed and barred with benches and all things of proper preparation. So the old master was seen wending his way up the path with slow and measured steps as was his wont, and all felt that supreme hour had come. Upon his reaching the house and seeing the situation, he demanded to know in tones of authority what this meant. Frank Berry, the champion of the occasion, replied, you must give holiday, treat to a gallon of rum and three pounds of sugar or take a ducking. This was refused and scalded by the master and a threat that he would break the door down. This anathema greatly alarmed the little ones and a general cry was a result. An hour or more intervened and no terms could be agreed upon. The ultimatum was again repeated from within and only five minutes more were given to decide it. The master was unyielding and incorrigible and at the expiration of the time, the barricade was removed and the sortie made. The old man seized and hurried in the direction of the spring. The whole school followed. Arriving near the spring, a truce was asked for by the master and finally the terms demanded were agreed upon and Steve Hill and Anthony Bates were dispatched to Bogan's store for the rum and the sugar. They soon returned and the rum and sugar duly mixed and the whole school, girls and boys, did as the master, partook liberally and they all got happy and the school dismissed for the term and the show was over. These were some of the customs of this new county 55 years ago. A few years after this, Mr. Richardson left the county and moved to the newer county of DeKalb and settled on the McDonough Road eight miles from Decatur where he died. I cherish till yet the memory of my old schoolmaster because he was my first schoolmaster, although he taught me to call the last letter in the alphabet Izzard, which took John S. Wilson a whole year afterwards to correct. His wife Hannah, which my friend Massey says was not that, was the very opposite of her husband in looks, actions, and religion. While he was lean, shallow, and slow, a universalist in religion, and slept with one eye open, she was fat, florid, quick-mouthed, and a Methodist and slept with both eyes open, I reckon. She was a good housewife and kept her house neat and was neat and tidy in her dress and wore a hat with a feather in it, but wore no pin backs and did not hold up her dress to show underneath her skirt. Signed, W. Okay, that's the article, um, Davy Richardson, my old schoolmaster. And it's written about the time around 1823, 1822. And he mentions where the Mount Zion um, schoolhouse is. Initially, my thought was this was, when he said Mount Zion, my mind goes to the Mount Zion church that is on Ridge Road just off of Hamilton Mill. However, some of the other clues in the story point us in a different direction. So let me take you there and tell you some of what I know. Maybe we can piece this together. Okay, the things that he talks about in this story um, one of them is that the schoolhouse, the old Mount Zion schoolhouse he's talking about, lies about a mile to the southeast of Bogan's store, uh, now known as the Hog Mountain House. We know that place for a fact, that that was at the juncture of 324 and 124, Gravel Springs Road, Gravelston Highway, up in this area, kind of where the Kroger and all that stuff is, now where the Pop Shelf is located, somewhere right at that crossroads was the area where the Hog Mountain House was. So if we go a mile southeast from here, let's see if we'll be able to just kind of get a, a rough idea. If I go from here a mile southeast, that takes me, if we follow the old original road, that would have been Auburn Road as it's now known, that would take us to this area where Old Fountain and Jim Moore are at. Now, it talks about that Davy Richardson walked there 
coming from his house at the time on the Jefferson Road by Dr. Freeman's. Now we can use some of the other clues that we know, such as the Union Cavalry map from 1865, uh, some of the 1800s road maps, including the 1932 road map. And what would have been the older roads? There's two possibilities in that area. Dr. Freeman's house was here at the juncture of Dequila Road and Fence Road, where the Kroger, the post office, all that, that crossroads that Hebron Church is. That was um, Freeman Town or Freeman's Crossroads. So Dr. Freeman lived there. And it said that Davey lived near the banks of the um, Appalachie on the old Jefferson Road. Um, my belief is that the Jefferson Road would have been what is now the Fence Road today because that road originally came up and tied in this area and through this direction. And Bailey Woods Road, my grandfather always told me, was the oldest road in the area not um, 324, the fence community was in this area, but he always told me Bailey Woods Road was an older road and it had just kind of fallen away. I uh, believe that's true. If you drive Bailey Woods Road, you'll see it sits kind of at the top of the ridge line there. So that would have made sense that that was the older path. Um, the other option that could have been on this man's recollections, because he's thinking 55 years back when he wrote this article, could have been to Kula Road as we know it now, and that would have been down below the Elijah Wynn House. That um, road at the bottom was, uh, that's where it crosses the Appalachie. So that area or fence road crosses the Appalachie. Either one of those could have been where Davy Richardson lived. Both of them would have been about the same distance walk. The Decule Road would have been a little bit shorter. Um, coming up, either one of those pathways would have taken you by a home that would have been right in here. And that would have been the old Hill family place. Talks about Steve Hill and the story. I also talked about the Bates, that's an old name that was later known in the Lawrenceville area. But, um, so that relates us, we know we're in the right spot. The site of the house itself was near a meeting house. They said in most cases, and I believe so at the same case, the old Mount Zion um, house or meeting house, whatever it may have been. Uh, it would have been unique to have one kind of right at this spot because you're only a mile from Hog Mountain Church, which has some very old roots. but. High Mountain Church doesn't get established until after this story happens, so we know that this probably predates that. So there probably was a meeting house here. A couple of reasons to think that's true. Um, I remember as a small child uh, being told by a couple of older individuals that there was a cemetery that was supposedly in the area of Jim Moore Road and Old Fountain Road, and that they didn't do any research when they corrected the route of the roads there, and so it was lost to time correcting the routes of the road. Let me speak to that. So if we go to the map, Old Fountain Road and Jim Moore Road and Auburn Road 324, they now lie at a juncture that is just a standard crossroads. Um, however, if we were to zoom in, back until I was probably in starting in high school, Jim Moore Road as it came out here actually came over in this direction, came over and behind Gold's Gym and tied in right here. Old Fountain Road, as far as I've always known it, has been here. That's called Old Fountain because it went to the Old Fountain place. Um, just past, at the bottom of the Old Fountain Road, it crosses the Appalachian, and that was the uh, the extension. So what we're looking at now is what's called Headright Lands. These were parts of the United States um, when the treaties were drawn up in 1790 with George Washington and the Treaty of New York. At the Appalachian, just beyond that, is what they call the lottery portion of Lenox County. Those pieces were given out as a result of land lotteries. Over there near what's known as Rabbit Hill in that area was the Fountain Homestead. They got that lottery piece over there. And so this road took you from what probably was the Mount Zion Meeting House Schoolhouse down across the Appalachian uh, at a nice ford. You can see kind of how it's swampy down there now. That would have been a much easier place to cross if there was a good bedrock there. If it was swamp like it is nowadays, probably had to cross a different place, but that road nonetheless went across there, up the top of the hill to where the fountain place was at. So that's why it's called Old Fountain Road, because it went to the Old Fountain Place. Jim Moore was a settler who came down actually much later. He came down in the uh, 1870s. They came to the area. Um, but the Jim Moore Road originally came in this other direction, and there was a hill in this area. So if we were to take the little Google person here, and drop them at this intersection. And we look around, looking in this direction where Jim Moore Road goes straight across. This was originally a hill. 
right in this area. It was a hill that came all the way across. If you look up, you can see the top of the hill up there. As we look back this way, you see that it rises again. So the hill was actually right through here and the road, Chimor Road originally came out much further up in this direction. I was always told there was a cemetery somewhere in this area, um, which probably was true. Uh, this story kind of helps to reinforce that that could have been a possibility. Uh, but that's all it is at this point. It's just a possibility and it's probably lost to time. But nonetheless, that's one of the unique parts of looking at this story and trying to put those pieces together. Um, I'll go on and just, you know, mention a couple of other little quick things. He mentioned that uh, Davy Richardson was in 1812, um, in the War of 1812, and that he was a good picket in his regiment because one eye never closed. And whatever that story is, I did look. Couldn't find exactly a Davy Richardson, but I did find a Richardson with a similar background that did make his way down to DeKalb County. So could have been the same guy, may or may not have been. But nonetheless, that gives you a little picture of what the area looked like, what some people thought about it. And hopefully uh, you'll find uh, you know, another story somewhere you can share with us. Again, thank you for your patience as uh, it's been some time since I posted something. If you like the story, let me know. And if you wanna hear something else, prefer to know a few other details on something else, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I wanna thank a couple of people that have reached out. Um, one lady who reached out from the Brasselton, Houston area um, had asked about um, some old structures that were located near the area of Duncantown, and that was actually an African-American church campground. Uh, I've tried to grab some stuff on that. There's just not a lot of resources I'm able to pull together, but I'll see if I can't find that in the future. And then also um, some people reached out about uh, Thompson Mill, and that was, of course, a mill over um, on the Jackson Gwinnett border, uh, Jackson Gwinnett Barrow border um, near where the uh, Amazon warehouse and stuff is. That was the last covered bridge in Gwinnett County that got burned. I want to say in the 70s, it took you over into Houston, kind of in that area. Thompson Mills was over there off a branch of a, a railroad and stuff. So if I'm able to gather some of those, I'll try to do something on that. If you have any other ideas, feel free to reach out. Thanks. Let me know if you want to hear any other stories. Yeah, I mean, I stand still with Lynette Rambler. Thanks.